Will you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, reading verses 41 to 52. And thinking about this subject this morning, Christ in the classroom. Luke 2, verses 41 to 52. Hear the word of the Lord. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not this saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all of these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. <clears throat> For our text this morning, I'd like for us to look at two verses from this selection, <clears throat> verses 46 and 47. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Christ in the classroom. This morning I want you to think with me about another aspect of Christ's coming into the world and its effects upon our human life. I want you to think of Christ in relationship to what we might call the classroom. You know there are many byproducts of Christ's coming into the world which have resulted from his presence here, but which were not the principle or the precise purpose for which he came. And one of these byproducts is the intellectual advancement of mankind. Perhaps we do not stop to think that we owe much. Indeed, in one sense, we owe all that we have of the advancement of human knowledge and the increase of human learning to the coming into the world of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read this morning that portion of Scripture in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, where we have a picture of our Lord sitting in the midst of the teachers. The doctors, as they are called in the King James Version of the Bible, they weren't doctors of medicine. If they were doctors at all, they were doctors of divinity. The word doctors here simply means teachers. And I see the Lord Jesus sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. And I see here an indication of the influence which Christianity has exerted over the intellectual history of mankind. And I see a reminder of the importance, an importance greater today than it has ever been of keeping Jesus Christ in the center of our educational programs. 
where his influence is responded to, the results have always been helpful, beneficial, productive of good. But where his influence has been allowed to wane, man's whole intellectual life and the life of mankind in general suffers and deteriorates. And I want to think along that line with you this morning. I want to make it practical if I can in your thinking and in mine and in the outworkings of these things in our lives today. The impact upon the thinking of men since his coming into the world. The Lord Jesus appears here as one who provoked the minds of the teachers of his day. He sat in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. And he was seeking to stimulate their intellectual processes, if you will, to a fresh search after truth and a fresh inquiry into the reality of the things that perhaps they had long understood academically, but he was provoking them to a fresh inquiry. He was asking them questions. And they were questions that were designed to lead them to some conclusions. He never did stop asking questions of those teachers, those scholars of his day. You trace him on through the record of the Gospels, and you find him again and again confronting them with questions in order to get them to think seriously and to think rightly concerning the things which matter most. And it's been that way ever since the Lord Jesus was here on earth. It just wasn't that way while he was present. Wherever the knowledge of Christ has gone in the intervening centuries, between his birth and this Christmas season, the minds of men have been opened to a new understanding. A new understanding of God, of course, for he came to reveal the Father, as he had hitherto not yet been revealed, and to an understanding of themselves, and to an understanding of the world about them. This has all been the fruitage and the outcomes of the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. You only need to compare the areas of the world where the knowledge of Christ has not gone with the areas of the world where he has been made known to see how mightily, how almost amazingly the coming of the Lord Jesus opens the minds of men to light and and truth of every kind. He is indeed that true light coming in the world that lighteneth every man. The classic statement that we hear so often quoted from the writings and from the lips of Lord Kelvin, the famous astronomer, might be written over the whole course of man's intellectual progress. Kelvin said, I am thinking God's thoughts after him. I am thinking God's thoughts after him. And where men have been willing to be led to the light of the truth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, they have indeed been thinking God's thoughts, eternal thoughts, infinite thoughts. They've been thinking God's thoughts after him. And their minds have been led out to wider and broader avenues of truth and understanding. Browning the poet once said, I say that the acknowledgement of God in Christ, accepted by thee, solves for thee every problem in the earth and out of it, and has so far advanced thee to be wise. The acknowledgement of God in Christ has so far advanced thee to be wise. Now the authority of Christ and the acceptance of the authority of Christ in areas of education have never restricted, but has always expanded man's mental development and enlarged his mind 
and his thinking faculties. Most of the scientific research, many of the discoveries that have added to our store of knowledge, many of the skills that men have acquired down through the ages, which have improved his own usefulness and his own effectiveness in the world, these have followed in the wake of the gospel of Christ. Mark you, in the wake of the gospel of Christ. They have not been its forerunners. They have been its product. And only where Jesus Christ and the knowledge of Jesus Christ has gone throughout the world have these developments to which I have referred have taken place. I wonder if we realize that here in these United States of America, that the peak of our intellectual progress was reached by giving to Jesus Christ his central place in the thinking of our scholars and in the teaching of our young people and the emphasis laid upon the truths of the Word of God in our educational systems. One of the early endowments of Harvard University was made by John Harvard himself. And the stipulation that he laid down in connection with that endowment was as follows, and I quote his words. Harvard said, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies. To know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of knowledge and learning. I'd like to emphasize that statement. To lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of knowledge and learning. And to see the Lord as a giver of all wisdom. Let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to see Christ as his Lord and Master. Now that was characteristic not only by this one university, but by all of the great universities of this land when they first came into being. They all laid at the bottom, as Harvard said. They all laid at the bottom the true knowledge of God through Jesus Christ and the acceptance of Him as God and Savior. Now that's not surprising when you think in the terms which Scripture refers to Him. We read that in Him dwelleth all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. One of Christ's titles is the wisdom of God as well as the power of God. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that light streams in upon men's consciousness, upon his mind, as he opens his heart to Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He lighteneth every man who is led of the Holy Spirit to believe in him. You know, it's always been an amazing thing to me that the world, which owes so much of its advancement along culture and intellectual lines, has been so unready to acknowledge its debt. Mankind is so prone to refuse admittance and acceptance of the one from whom all of these benefits have flowed into our lives. Now, Christ is not only the end of the law for righteousness to those that believe, but he is also the end for the search of truth for all of those who believe. Jesus said, I am the truth. And as I see the Lord Jesus as a boy of 12 years of age, sitting in the midst of those teachers, both hearing them and asking them question, the prayer goes up from my heart. And the desire goes up from my heart that in our day, the Lord Jesus might be given his place 
in the midst of the teachers, that they might listen to him, that they might heed his questions, that they might open their minds to those avenues of truth and the search for truth which he would provoke in them. Alas, the institutions of learning in our day, for the most part, are like the inn in Bethlehem. They have no room for the Son of God. He is shut out. And when the Supreme Court of the United States banned God out of the classroom and closed the door against His Word and against His name, if you will, they didn't destroy God by any manner. They did dishonor Him. But in doing so, they destroyed their own effectiveness. And our educational system today, for the most part, is in the state of chaos. And I speak from the point of view from the great educators across this land today. The Lord Jesus asked question of these teachers that were designed to bring them to conclusions. We ask questions today without any expectation or any desire of getting an answer. We are satisfied to just question everything and to leave the matter there. And that is where a lot of our intellectualism is leading us today. As someone has so aptly put it, with our feet firmly planted in the air. And we're not going to lift society or lift civilization very far or very well by having our feet firmly planted in the air. We need our feet firmly planted upon some solid conclusions. And the questions that the Lord Jesus asked were designed to lead men to solid conclusions. He asked, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And men still wrestle with that question. And there can only be one answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And only where men are led to find that answer, under the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit, will man find their way to God, which will lead them to some real certainty and satisfaction in these areas. You know, there's a difference between facts and truth. I think we need to recognize that also. We tend to stuff our young people today with facts. They have to be taught the facts of life. And we're busy stuffing the facts of life into them. But what's the difference between facts and truth? Well, facts can be accepted without any corresponding sense of responsibility on my part. Two plus two equals four. But I don't see any moral obligation on my part resulting from that fact. The difference between facts and truth is that truth always carries with it a moral obligation. And this is a reason why men turn their back upon the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and the truth of that final revelation that God has given him himself in the Lord Jesus. Because the acceptance of that revelation carries with it an obligation and men would rather not have that. And so they turn their back upon the truth and the light that's shown in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the apostle speaks very directly to this matter of intellectualism. He speaks of being led astray by vain philosophies, which he says are not after Christ. According to Christ, should all of our systems of teaching and training and instruction be judged as to their value and their worth by this statement? Are they after Christ? I say yes, 
I say, yes, they ought to be. But only where instruction and education and learning and scholarship are conformed by that standard do they perform that which is beneficial to mankind. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We cut off the first part of that sentence in our educational slogans these days, and we simply reduce it to the truth shall make you free, without any certainty that we're ever going to arrive at the truth. But the Lord Jesus prefaced that statement by the statement, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth, the truth can only be known as we see it in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I reiterate, when the Supreme Court took God out of the classrooms and out of our system of instruction, it accomplished a great decline in our public educational system. And it accomplished a great deterioration in the character and the caliber of our society, which reflects what our young people learn or fail to learn in the classroom. Someone has well said, if you take out of some of our so-called good educational programs, good, G-O-O-D, if you take out the word God, G-O-D, all you have left is a zero, and it's hard to build very much on a zero. I don't need to emphasize to you here this morning the vast change that has come over the educational life of these United States of America within the last 50 years. And quite correspondingly, not only the intellectual life of the nation has been weakened, but the moral fiber of the nation has been drastically reduced. I'm going to read to you something here this morning. I'm not going to tell you at the beginning where I found it, but I will tell you that it was not in any of our modern textbooks. And I quote, If you can induce a community to doubt the genuineness and authenticity of the scriptures, to question reality and obligations of religion, to hesitate on deciding whether there be any such thing as virtue or vice, whether there be any eternal state of retribution beyond the grave, or whether there be any such being as God, you have broken down the barriers of moral virtue and hoisted the floodgates of immorality and crime. I need not say that when a people have once done this, they can no longer exist as a tranquil and happy people. Every bond that holds society together would be ruptured. Fraud and treachery would take the place of confidence between man and man. The tribunals would be scenes of bribery and injustice. Avarice, perjury, ambition, and revenge would walk through the land and make it more like the dwelling of savage beasts than the tranquil abode of civilized and Christianized men and women. Does somebody have an idea where that came from? The 1854 edition of McGuffey's Readers. This was a kind of ethics. That was a sign, kind of, sort of moral code, if you please, that was built into the lives of boys and girls 150 years ago and for a great many years after that. I know my grandfather studied out of McGuffey's Readers and he was born in 1865. So about 1880, 1878 to 1880, I know he studied out of McGuffey's Readers. You don't get that kind of content in school textbooks today. You get a lot of insipid little facts like C 
Jane Run. But where do you get the truth? The kind of truth that is expressed in this McGuffey's Reader's statement. And that's the kind of thing that characterized the educational programs in the earlier days of this republic. I believe that if we were to recover the moral conscience of this nation and reclaim some of the waste places in the life of the nation, that we again need to get back to allowing Jesus Christ and his word and his truth to be central in all of our teaching and learning. This is a Christmas season. And we can get very sentimental about the baby in the manger. But there are certain implications of that baby's presence in the manger that the masses of people are prone to miss. When I say Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger, that's a simple fact of history. But when I say God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, I am saying more than a statement of fact. I'm expressing an infinite truth. And that truth lays its claim upon your heart and upon mine. When I say the Father sent the Son into the world, again I'm expressing a fact that is generally accepted in a superficial way by the masses. But when I say the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, then that becomes something that challenges my own heart and mind. If he sent him to be the Savior, is he my Savior? Have I responded to the truth that there's no other way to God but by him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Long ago, the Son of God knocked at the door of the world. And the answer was, there is no room. We have no room in the inn. And I believe that the challenge of the hour in which we are living is for parents and leaders and teachers to support an educational system where, as John Harvard said, Jesus Christ is laid at the bottom as the only foundation of wisdom and learning. And until we are ready to do that, until we're able to, we will not turn the tide of godlessness and atheism that is spreading across our country today. Now in closing, I'd like to have a couple of comments the first thing is, I believe that we ought to thank the many fine Christian men and women who continue to teach in a system where Christ is not laid at the bottom as the only foundation of wisdom and learning. These teachers on a daily basis do show forth Christ in the classroom by their love for each student, by their sense of fairness, by their kind smile, and by their helpful attitude. We need to say thank you to them. And then the second thing I would like to say, that I'm not unmindful of the fact that Christian education is expensive, especially after you pay your taxes for the public education. And I'm not unmindful of the fact that there's not an appropriate Christian education school in every community. But my prayer is that we as a congregation at Parkwoods Presbyterian might continually be a congregation that prays for our young people, that sets a good example for them, that encourages each one of them in their walk with the Lord. In closing, this morning, we're going to be singing a song here in a minute. And we sing, Children come, hither come, and unto me give ear. I shall you teach to understand how ye the Lord should fear. 
Our text was on verses 46 to 47. And when it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And our prayer is that your, prince, your presence may once again be central in all of our educational systems throughout this nation and around the world. May Jesus Christ be laid at the bottom as the only foundation of wisdom and learning. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.